Thanks very much. And I, I just want to start. Oh, <laughs> interrupted the woman. I just want to start by um, thanking Joe and Neil for organising this great conference, um, giving us all something to to do in the pandemic. <laughs> no, no, for persevering and uh, organising us to meet here, nevertheless, and for for inviting me. So there's, I uh, really enjoyed Billy's talk uh, this morning. I'm looking forward to the other talks on the lineup. Um, so I mean, today I'm going to be talking about a rather historical. It'll be a broadly kind of historical talk, but one which I hope um, is going to resonate with a very contemporary discussion at the end. So, you know, hang in there if you're not in, in historically inclined. Um, I mean, the, the when when I saw the conferences about these alternative approaches to realism, um, I mean, personally, I think that, that um, you know, a, there's a, already a lot of distinctions that need to be drawn about what we even mean by realism. And, uh, you know, for example, I'm thinking of, of the muddy waters of a distinction like eliminativism and non-eliminativism. Um, so, you know, we often hear things like, you know, if you're talking about structural realism, you know, um, you know, do they really reject scientific individuals and, and what, do, what do these objects amount to and kind of relations without relata and that kind of thing. Um, so that's the kind of background because I'm going to look at a debate that can be found um, as part of the Frege Hilbert controversy, which is basically, you know, um, a kind of argument that Frege and Hilbert had over the fundamental nature and purpose of the axiomatic method back at the kind of turn of the 19th century. Um, I think that this, tracking what's going on in this kind of notoriously elusive dialectic will actually um, give us some of the tools to distinguish um, some more uh, modern and sophisticated kind of approaches uh, that, that we see now in um, the philosophy of science more generally. Um, and I, so I'll take, so what I'll do, I'll take you through um, what's relevant um, in the Frege Hilbert controversy, and in particular, I want to bring out uh, Hilbert's uh, own distinctive kind of structuralism. So that, that's the kind of central aim of the talk, I suppose. And I want to talk about the sense in which Hilbert is an eliminativist and the sense in which he's a non Um And then finally, I want to kind of uh, sum up with a kind of broad picture that I will extract from Hilbert's view. Now, a lot of this uh, is, although I'm basing it on Hilbert, there's a lot of mining going on. You know, I'm reconstructing uh, what I hope to show you as a kind of uh, interesting uh, position, which manages to straddle a kind of realism, straddle, sorry, a kind of realism and uh, a very kind of radical structuralism. Um, and I think that we can find this in Hilbert and that it deserves um, it deserves some development uh, within the context of the modern debate. So I'll just kind of talk about that at the end. And I'd, you know, I'm mostly kind of uh, working in this field. So I would be very interested, uh, especially, you know, those of you at the conference here um, to hear how you, how you think that Hilbert's, this kind of Hilbertian view that I'll offer um, how it kind of interacts with with these various uh, debates that you're familiar with. Okay, so we'll just start quickly with um, Hilbert structuralism. So you might you might um, already be a bit puzzled if I mention Hilbert structuralism because usually if people know about the about David Hilbert, they associate with him with the more, his more famous later formalist positions. But actually, at uh, the turn of the 19th century, um, Hilbert was, it's quite, was quite uncontroversially uncon uncon a structuralist. Um, and there has been a, a sub small but substantial kind of amount of uh, uh, scholarship done on this to, uh, to extract Hilbert's uh, early structuralist positions. And there's been recently some excellent work done to show that his early structuralism actually underlined and influences a lot of his later formalism. So it's, it's not a completely discontinuous view, but I won't go into that today. But here is the place where most people point to, it's maybe his most uh, infamous and clear kind of uh, historical dictum. So he says, um, it's surely obvious that every theory in, 
is only a scaffold or schema of concepts together with their necessary relations to one another. And that the basic elements can be thought of in any way one likes. If in speaking of my points, I think of some system of things, for example, the system love law chimney sweeps, then and then assume all my axioms as relations between these things, then my propositions, e.g. E Pythagoras' theorem, are also valid for these things. Right, so we have a very stark kind of um, structural opening here, which um, fits in with a broader historical context. So it's really Hilbert along with Poincaré, who were, were kind of dominant figures in, um, in kind of this modern this kind of structuralist approach which um happens in mathematics in, in the wake of Dedekind. Um and we can see it particularly starkly in geometry. So I, I will be and that is the subject uh Hilbert's reaximatization of Euclidean geometry is forms the basis of of the correspondence written between Frege and Hilbert. So it's because I'm speaking about geometry a lot because that, that's what they are arguing about. So let's get straight to ask in what sense is Hilbert an eliminativist? So Hilbert has been interpreted, for example, by Resnick uh, as a straight down the line eliminativist. But I think the interest for us is really about what that means. And just to uh, answer by, I'll answer that by immediately giving this definition. So um, we have, first of all, Phrygian objects. So what you know, a lot of you will know this, but what I mean by this is um, is an object which is independent. It admits of different modes of presentation. It's a proper referent of a singular term. It's, full, it's a full-blooded object, as Dummett likes to say. It's the subject matter of a theory. So, you know, uh, they can be both abstract and concrete. Mathematical objects are objects, and just as much as Julius Caesar. And so on and so on. So that that's all the kind of uh, classic kind of uh, Phrygian properties of an object. And then, so I'll say that a Phrygian object is an object whose properties do not need to follow from its axiomatic characterization. What is that really meant? I'm just saying that. Let's say that we make, you know, we characterize a system of of points and lines and planes uh, using an axiomatic theory. By axiomatic theory, by the way, I just mean um, in the context of mathematics, uh, some kind of formalized or semi-formalized uh, collection of uh, explicit axioms. Um, and, and then the axiomatized theory is a deductive closure of, all, of that axiom set. Um, so we have uh, the Phrygian objects would be objects which, of course, we can characterize them axiomatically, but they might turn out to have properties that surprise us that aren't captured in our axiomatic characterization. Um, so to cut a long story short, which I've told in a, in a much longer way otherwise, I think that Hilbert can be seen as an, an eliminativist with respect to these objects, with respect to this conception of objects. So, um, and in particular, when it comes to axiomatic theory. So if you're talking about Hilbert's view of axiomatic theory, he um, he's eliminativist about these objects. But even here, we have to be careful because I think that He's a limnativist about Phrygian objects, not because he thinks that chimney sweeps don't exist, but because he doesn't think they're part of the proper ontological inventory of mathematics or something like that. So they're, you might say that they're relegated from the ontology of the axiomatic theory. Um, and, and we'll just kind of unpack this a bit more as we go on. Um, so now I want to just introduce a kind of second conception of objects. Um, oh, maybe I should mention, Hilbert is an eliminativist um, for a certain reason. It's a very motivated why he relegates these Phrygian objects. And the reason for that is that it's basically the, the paradoxes. So the paradoxes were actually known to Hilbert already um, by the time that uh, Russell uh, was writing to was explaining them to Frege. Um, Hilbert already had the grasp of them. And um, you can ask me over at this if you're interested, but the long and the short of that is that Hilbert's worry was if we, uh, if we let these Phrygian objects into our proper logical mathematical ontology, 
their kind of you know, I mentioned before that they can have natures that outstrip their characterization in the axiomatic theory. And these properties which the object had could lead to inconsistency within the theory. So they're they're kind of we might want to say they're logically unhygienic. Now Hilbert is also in a certain sense not a limitivist, and this is something I've argued for at length. And that's because he's not a limit an eliminativist um with respect to what he calls his Gedanken, so or or his thought, the objects of thought as he calls them. Um so let's let's just look at okay. So yeah, so what I'm really saying here is that there's an eliminativist and a non-eliminative strand running here um with the kind of ontology that Hilbert's attaching to the, the axiomatic theory. So what are these thought objects? They're not going to be for gain. What are they? Here's some things Hilbert says about them. So in, his, in the manuscripts from his archives, he, he says very starkly, the points and the lines and the planes of my geometry are nothing other than things of thought, and as such have nothing whatsoever to do with real points, lines and planes. So, so here we have, uh, you know, um, a, ve a very kind of stark contrast between um, what he calls real points and lines and planes. So let, let's interpret that as, as Frege's classic realist position of objects. Um, and he's contrasting his own um, conception of objects here. And we get a bit more from the foundations of logic and arithmetic where he writes, having thus established a certain property for the axioms adopted here, we recognize they never lead to any contradiction at all. Therefore, we speak of the thought objects defined by means of them as consistent not notions or operations as consistently existing. So it's the thought objects that he takes the consistency of the axioms to establish, um, not the the kind of, uh, you know, not anything else. He's, he's not using the fact that these are not real to say that they don't exist. He's saying that oh, the, the theory establishes their existence in this sense. And finally, we have Hilbert's infamous uh, principle. So uh, the proposition that our two square roots of minus one is true and the existence of such roots is proven as soon as the axioms that are two square roots of minus one can be added to the other arithmetical axioms without reason, possibility of contradiction. Blah, blah, blah. So, you know, here we have um, the the idea that as long as so if we if we produce an axiomatized theory as long as the axiom set can be can be established as consistent then the object these kind of thought objects necessarily exist now this is a very you know people have interpreted this in all sorts of ways obviously it strikes you as very controversial at the start because we wouldn't want to go around consistently defining things into existence um, ordinarily, and indeed in many branches of science, uh, there's many consistent things which just don't exist. Um, but th this here, uh, Hilbert's principle here, uh, just think of it at the moment at least as relegated to um, uh, mathematics. Uh, and also, it's not that we're existing, uh, it's not that we're defining into existence these, uh, like, ob like uh, our usual conception of objects or even our a realist conception of mathematical objects, as Frege gave us, but these kind of uh, thought objects. Um, okay, and so, you know, I'm going to use some modern terminology here to kind of track what's going on, but first I'll give this definition. So, I'm saying a Hilbertian object is an object which has all and only this property, all and only those properties which follow from its axiomatic characterization, excuse me. Um, and we're contrasting that with a Fregean object, it's an object whose, ob whose properties may not follow from its axiomatic characterization. So in that sense, the Hilbertian object is exhaustively defined by its, its um, axiomatization. There are no properties that it has beyond its, its axiomatization. Now, um, what I don't want, to, there are problems with this view, it's by no means perfect. Um, and I think there's an interesting discussion to be had with them that won't be had today. I mean, we have, uh, you know, 
I mean, even Russell raised to Dedekind the the objection originally that, that the extrinsic properties should follow from the in, intrinsic. And so for a for a definition like this, we're we're not going to have that, for example, uh, these Hilbertian objects can be um, someone's favourite number or someone's favourite object. Um, and even, I think the most worrying thing of all is we may worry that we can't say of these objects that they do have all and only those properties which follow from their axiomatic characterization, um, unless that's axiomatically specified in some way. Uh, so, so that that is a kind of worrying uh, position to be in. But anyway, all I want to do is draw a line between two types of objects at the moment. One are what in the modern terminology we call them thin objects. I'm calling them kind of Hilbertian objects or basic elements. Um, for mathematical structuralists, they're they're known. These would be non-eliminative objects. Um, and Shapiro would call them places or offices. Um, on the other hand, we have thick objects. Uh, you know, many think of them as Phrygian, Platonist, full-blooded objects, and what Shapiro calls places or objects. And it's a distinctive advantage that Shapiro claims for his account is that he can have uh, both of these objectual conceptions and all the advantages that follow from them. So that's something that he claims is a distinctive advantage for his anti-rim structuralism. Okay, so why am I drawing this line in the sand between these two conceptions? It's because I think that that is the best way to bring out, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the best way to bring out the sense in which Hilbert's axiomatization of Euclidean geometry that we can find in his Grundlagen is a limitivist and non eliminativist It's a limitivist with respect to these freaking objects, and it's non eliminative with respect to these Hilbertian objects. But the really interesting thing relevant to us that I want to look at now is the relationship between these two types of objects. Um, how do they interact with each other? Because I will suggest later I will build a tracking these two, this, two, this distinction between these two different types of objects into the distinction between two different uh, kinds of scientific theory. So we have two quotes from Hilbert here. I think this is, this is a very, uh, let's start with this one. Um, this is from his Grundlagen der Mathematik, so a bit later. He says, um, through this mapping, the investigation becomes completely detached from concrete reality. The theory has nothing more to do with real objects or the intuitive content of knowledge. It is a pure thought construction of which one can no longer say it's true or false. Nevertheless, this framework has a meaning for knowledge of reality in the sense that it presents a possible form of actual connections. Um, Somewhat confusingly, Hilbert goes between saying that the consistency of the axiom set establishes the truth of the axioms and that we can't say that the axioms are true or false. So I let's just shelf that. But here we have the idea, uh, again, that the, the purity of the thought construction is important because, again, we don't want to leave ourselves vulnerable to paradox. Um, there's, there's a clean cut between... Um, the real objects and the, the kind of thought objects um, in order to preserve this purity, but there's still a relevance, there's a, there's a mapping. Um, and this mapping preserves what he calls the possible form of actual connections. Now, mappings are cheap, so um, what's really going on? Um, so is there anything substantial going on apart from that and what Frege and what Hilbert thinks the relationship between at the actual objects of geometry and his thought objects of geometry are, are is there anything else here? I think not. Um, so we can see Hilbert addresses this directly, actually, in the correspondence to Frege. And uh, I'll just I'll just share what he reads here quickly. So he says the application of a theory to the world of appearances, as he calls it always requires a certain measure of goodwill and tactfulness, e.g. that we substitute the smallest possible bodies for points and the longest, longest possible ones, e.g. light rays for lines. 
The further a theory has been developed and the more finely articulated its structure, the more obvious the kinds of application it has to the world of appearances. It takes a very large amount of ill will to want to apply the more subtle positions of plane geometry or of Maxwell's theory of electricity to other appearances than ones for which they were meant. Now, if we look at all the constraining, uh, all, all the constraints that Hilbert here puts on uh, the mapping between the world of appearances and the application of the theory, we actually have um, nothing more than psychological constraints. Um, and I think that that's because Hilbert thought that it's exactly these kind of constraints um, that are going to determine uh, how we how we carry out this application of our axiomatic theory. Now, here um, I want to take us through a kind of tension that's emerging that's, that is a bit ambiguous in Hilbert's writings that I think can be resolved. On the one hand, Hilbert seems to allow for any interpretation. And in the second, he seems, on the other hand, he seems to prevent any extra theoretical interpretation. So if we go back to the original quote that we saw was very uh, canonical of his structuralist view. Um, on the one hand, um, well, I think it, it leaves itself open to, to these two interpretations. So we could have a permissibility reading of this, where we say that, look, the, the theory or the, the schema of concepts, the scaffold, the conceptual scaffold, is, um, you know, gets a bit poetic, the correspondence between Frege and Hilbert. Um, so here, here we have um, the encode, we could have on the one hand that it is encoding positions for the thick objects, but indiscriminately. Um, and on the other hand, we could have a purity reading which says it's encoding that this conceptual scaffold encodes positions for the thin objects only and resists any extra theoretical commitment from the, the kind of interpretation we might give it. I think that once we set aside the undoubtedly correct point that Hilbert, who was after all the, the father of, of model theory, um, he does, of course, think that his his axiom his theory his axiomatized theory can be reinterpreted. Then we can say that um, he can hold at the same time um, that the theory is completely detached outside the theory. There's kind of nothing there, as it was, um, and at the same time there are elements of the theory which you can interpret in any way you like. So, um, in the other and the other in, the, in other words, the purity, it, we should have the purity reading um, of, of this tension. Because really, um, really what we've got here is, after all, if you were going to, the fact that you can interpret the geometric axioms, um, you know, using a, a fragment of the reals, it doesn't mean that the real numbers are geometric objects. Okay, so just to give some, just to put some of, of this discussion here in, in some modern terminology. So I'm claiming that Hilbert um, has an algebraic, ontologically and limited approach with respect to what we might broadly call thick objects. And he has an assertory ontologically non limited approach with, with respect to thin objects. And this is significant because um, this is the advantage, uh, the fact that he has a position with respect to both of these objects is a kind of unique advantage that, that Shapiro claims for his account of structuralism. And I only mention that because it shows that, you know, Hilbert can, Hilbert's account is just as interesting as kind of contemporary accounts. But I, I want to also mention here that, that this uh, the way that I've been talking about Hilbert being a non elimitivist might be a bit confusing uh, to some of you, because I know that there are accounts um, sometimes uh, called kind of moderate anti-individualist accounts in the philosophy of science, um, where Hilbert's view, as I've been outlining it, would actually count as an eliminative, an, an eliminativist view. 
Um, I'm actually thinking of views like Neil, your um, algebraic structuralism, which st still has a commitment to elements. I think this is, is mostly just a, a terminological um, kind of problem, but um, what it shows is how elusive this eliminativist, non-eliminativist distinction is. And the only important point that I want to make is the distinction between the two kinds of objects. Um, because it corresponds in Hilbert to the distinction between two very different kinds of theory. Okay, and that, this, this is where I want to really join this, uh, this kind of historical diagnosis up to more modern accounts. So um, I think that me and, and Billy have been put in this first slot because we're the people with big diagrams. <laughs> so here we go. Um, this this is just to talk us through um really all the different things that, that are going on in, in Hilbert's kind of conception. So there's the distinction between what he's calling the world of appearances and, and the kind of axiomatic theory itself. I'm going to split that into formal theory and informal theory. Um and we, we can say that they're connected in some way. The formal theory um is what Hilbert's concerned with, the axiomatized theory. Um, it's going to, the, the way that it works is that, so let's just take Hilbert's axioms in the Grundlagen as an example. So he, he defines like 12 axioms. Um, you can look at the axiom set, you know, it's defining the kind of uh, primitive behavior of points and lines and planes and that kind of thing. If you go through the axiom set and you kind of poke out all the, um, all the geometric primitives like point and line and plane. These these are the these are the primi these primitives are implicitly defined by the theory itself. Um, so what that means is really that the axiom set is is a kind of outline of a structure. It, it defines a structure. Um, if and only if um, the axiom set is consistent. So, so that's a very roundabout way to say, again, Hilbert is worried about paradox. He says that we must ensure that the axiom set is, con is consistent. If it's consistent, then it's latching onto something in mathematical reality. What is that thing? It's a structure. The, we can think of the nodes in the structure as, um, as objects in a very thin sort of object. Really, those those no, those kind of thin Hilbertian objects, um, they're really dependent on this. Is, can you hear me? Is my internet? Oh, there it's gone back. Okay. Um, those kind of thin objects are dependent on the structure um, in the sense that they're really just reifications of the positions in the structure. You know, this is how minimal they are. They're exhaustively characterized by the axiomatic theory that we begin with. Um, so the only guarantee you need to know that you're referring to the stru a structure with your formal theory is that the theory is consistent. Um, but then there's the, the world of appearances, which we can also kind of uh, theorize about. Um, this kind of structure um, will interact with, I've said, represents or models. Um, a kind of real, you know, the real points and lines and planes. So this is really uh, space, space time. And of course, Hilbert, interestingly, is characterizing Euclidean space time, which we now know, um, we now know is not the correct model for space time. And yet, people still study it, of course, it's, you know, can have other kinds of uses, but that's fine because the axioms are consistent. It's um, then, of course, the informal theory of mathematics um, is going to be the one that refers only if, if the theory is true. Now, the problem here is that um, I'm only going to really suggestively say what the, this difference, I'm going to just um, not say anything really about 
the difference between this formal and informal theory because I think it has to be cashed out in quite a complicated way. In some scientific disciplines, we can have um, axiomatized theories. Um, you know, like that will be fine for the likes of mathematics and physics, but not really uh, for, well, at least for biology, they don't tend to go back to the to mathematics. Um, we might still think they go back to some kind of fundamental axiom set in terms of like some laws of uh, how molecules behave or something like that. Um, but whatever we counts as the kind of formalized theory of that scientific discipline <clears throat> is what we have here. So, you know, from this point of view, what is really what is really going on? We've got the availability of a realist picture here between the inform informal theory and the scientific phenomena. That's fine. We then can use our kind of empirical base or, or whatever to extract from the th formal theory a formalized version of that theory, um, which will refer to a structure with these thin objects in it. Um, the thin objects will represent model or, as I've said, of, as Hilbert would say, encode, um, it will, it will present a form of actual connections between the real objects of the scientific discipline. And so we have this kind of, um, we have this kind of, well, really looked at from this point of view, the formal theory is itself, um, it's like running a simulation of kind of organized abstractions which can feed back into our picture of the world and our predictive power for, for scientific knowledge and all that. So in terms of, you know, something like the, the no medicals argument, um, we can have a, a kind of new empirical discovery can make us uh, think of a new, can make us discover a new structure in the world. We can be realist about these structures here which have in common the structure here, but not the elements or the objects. Um, and so the canonical example of some kind of informal theory, you know, if we take something like this fifth force, fifth force of nature that we've had, you know, that people are excited about. Um, so this hypothesis, you know, we can see that on the kind of informal theory level at the moment as everyone frantically tries to to formalize it and, and get the get their first papers published. Um, once that's done, if the theory is consistent, it will ref, it will refer to a structure that's guaranteed. Whether that structure represents an an actualized structure in kind of scientific real and reality um, remains to be seen. Um, and th this is this is a so this is a mutually kind of informing process. I think this quote. I'm just going to take you to this quote. This is my final um, quote from Hilbert. Uh, so this is actually from Frege. I think it gives a nice picture of the interaction um, between these two levels of theory. Although he was using it to talk about something slightly different. Um, Frege writes to Hilbert again a bit more poetry here. The natural course of events seems to me as follows. What was originally saturated with thought hardens in time into a mechanism, which partly relieves the scientist from having to think. Similarly, in playing music, a series of processes which are originally conscious must have become unconscious and mechanical so that the artist, unburdened of these things, can put his heart into the playing. Um, I should like to compare this to the process of linguification. When a tree lives and grows, it must be soft and succulent. But if what was succulent did not turn in time into wood, the tree could not reach a great height. On the other on the other hand, when all that was green has turned to wood, the tree ceases to grow. And so in the same way here, we have the kind of hardened formal theory and we have the more informal theory going on um, to, for us to determine the kind of scientific phenomena that's under question. I mean, an exa a simple example might be um, if you think of set theory. So um, 
and the, there are many alternative uh, axiomatizations of set theory we could have. As long as they're consistent, they're all going to refer to a structure in the world. The structures, the, uh, sorry, a, a structure here. The structures will be distinct from each other because structures are completely uh, relativized to the axiom, their axiomatized characterization. Um, and you know, one of those structures will turn out to, to be the right one. Um, or indeed, it could turn out that all the structures were telling us something about the kind of uh, about what sets are like in this um, in reality. And you know, so of course we all know what sets are, and we can reason about them in common. And then when we kind of come to this formal approach, we're going to have to um, to split different conceptions up in a, in a in a certain useful way. So there's nothing here which would privilege. Uh, why why would we use one structure to model rather than another? Well, why would you use one one simulation rather than another for a scientific purpose? It's really going to come back to those psychological constraints of usefulness, naturalness of fit, and so on. So here we're really uh, going to relegate the questions of um, the questions of truth that the pessimistic meta induction um, makes us worry about to the informal theory, and since I'm, I'm thinking of the informal theory is going to be continuous with kind of natural language, then that actually bottoms out in some kind of classical problems of just that, that is the problem of the theory of, of reference or representation. So take your favorite pick there. You could have a direct reference theory, a two-step Frigian sense theory of Putnam internal realism. You know, you can plug that in at the bottom there. And the you're going to be uh, somewhat free of the pessimistic meta induction up and with the formal theory um, because it, it refers if it's consistent in that set so in the sense it exhausts the formal theory exhausts modal space that this can these kind of formal structures um, now there is going to be a slight re-emergence of the pessimistic meta induction um, which is actually brought about by the set theory set theoretic paradoxes themselves um, because how do we know that the theories, the formal theories that we're using are consistent? And this is this is kind of Frege's worry, really, and the correspondence. Um, well, of course, we'd be, we're still in a better position than we are with truth, because consistency is, is a more tractable notion, and we, we have some tools to prove it. Um, although most of these tools will get us relative consistency results, it's still going to be um, advantageous for us if we can kind of integrate all our different um, theories so that they stand and fall together under these relative consistency results. Um, so really, this is a kind of help. help what I'm suggesting is a Hilbertian picture, a Hilbertian structuralism. Just to say the last thing is, is that for Frege, Frege wanted the formal theory to go straight across here to the the real points and lines and planes. So that that's going to be the difference there. Do we think our formal theory is interacting directly with this scientific phenomena or uh, via these models? And looked at from the Hilbertian point of view, the theory, the formal theory, is itself a scientific instrument for studying the world? This is what I want to bring out. OK, that's it for me. So. Really, I've just argued that, that on Hilbert's conception, um, consistently axiomatized mathematical theories posit the existence of objects, then these objects exist, um, albeit in the sense of these thin idealized objects, the objects of mathematical non of structuralism or whatever. Um, and they're importantly distinct from thick Frigian objects, which are exhaustively characterized by the axioms that define them. And Hilbertian structuralism offers us this kind of interesting approach in the philosophy of science, which could make it possible to hold both classical realism um, via the informal theory and a kind of structuralism, which is quite radical in the sense uh, that it posits only the existence of thin elements as established by the formal theory. So thanks very much. <laughs>